In this podcast, we catch up with Borough's form, give our praise and place picks and answer your podcast questions. This is the Borough Breakdown podcast and this is all your Borough Match Day chatter in a pod. Support. Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for Craig Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Oh! Abanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Abanelli spots out. Hello and welcome to the Borough Breakdown podcast. We're back after an enforced break and in the time that my laptop was broken, Borough's form was fixed. We're now unbeaten in four games, but a goalless draw against Blackburn has left Borough's playoff hopes looking rather fanciful. I'm joined by Tom Green and Matt Rowney on this one. Guys, it's good to see you again after a week's break that I don't think any of us wanted. Um, that was my fault, my laptop broke. But last podcast, I asked you where your emotions were at with Borough's form not great and the season looking to head in the wrong direction. Obviously, since then, fortunes have changed. Things were looking up, but yesterday's goal to draw against Blackburn kind of feels more consequential than that. So, Matt, do you want to kick us off? Give me one word to describe how you're feeling after that game against Blackburn yesterday. Um. Oh. Maybe the word is hopeful. Um, hopeful. I mean, there was a part of me, I think, I, in an isolated manner, um, I was a little deflated after yesterday's game just because I felt like we were building up some really good momentum, a really good head of steam. And the big thing that I wanted to see from Borough was a convincing home performance. I kind of used the Norwich game as an anomaly because, you know, we were terrible up until the red card and then we did what we had to do. I still wanted us to put in a really good performance, 11 v 11. And we it just sort of felt a little bit flat after yesterday. But I think going over the course of the four games that we've had, seeing us go back or seeing us go to a back five, looking a lot more solid defensively, I think it's a it's a big step in the right direction. And even though we didn't win yesterday, it's still four games unbeaten. And I think we've took good steps forward in terms of how we look defensively. We just need to try and improve going forwards again and, and get that all important balance right which of course is the hardest thing to do with football so yeah disappointed in yesterday just because we did, couldn't keep the winning run going lost ground on the top six if we even want to mention the p word but <laughs> yeah I think I, I'm hopeful with the progress that Borough have made because if we look back to where we were after that Stoke defeat it was it was dire so yeah hopeful to see where we where we go from here very glass half full there, Matt. I quite like that because mine is is very opposite to that. I my my word to describe it is deflated. Like I yeah. stood there after full time and I I just felt that way because it was a big opportunity for Borough to really keep the keep up the, the ground on on Norwich and obviously they won the they beat Stoke and Borough. It, you know, it was a big opportunity because Blackburn had won just one in the last 16 games. It felt like if Borough really, really wanted to get into the top six, which of course, you know, the we've been side eye in the playoffs since this uh upturning form. That's obviously where we want to be. And it just felt like an opportunity squandered, unfortunately. So I think deflated is probably the word that, that I'd use. But Tom, what about you? What what one word are you going to give? It's going to sound like I'm really kind of sat in the middle of, of your two opinions here. But my words, if you can call it that, is just meh. Like <laughs> I thought of that as my word. I did think of meh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got in the car uh, yesterday after the game. I was listening to BBC T's and there was a lot of people texting in, uh, ringing in, going, oh, that's our chance at the playoffs gone and stuff like that. And I'm like, I was never really seriously expecting that we'd get in the playoffs. Um, I, I, even after three wins in a row and with the madness of this league going from suddenly you know, six points off the relegation zone to, oh, we might be back in the shout with the playoffs. There's just too many there's too many teams above us who have, have done better by this point. So like coming out of the game yesterday, as much as people were saying that, and I mean it, it's all great that we're undefeated four in a row, but I just I, I don't think we'd do well in the playoffs anyway. Um mm. I, I've always said 
well, for most of this season, I'm pretty sure my preseason prediction wasn't the case, but um, <laughs> that we'd click in March and April and uh, and narrowly miss out. I still stick by that. Um, but yeah, just because I was never seriously expecting us to get close to the playoffs anyway, yesterday's result didn't really do much um, to me, really. I'd have been more annoyed if Sam Gallagher had launched one in from 30 yards again. <laughs> You know, he, he forced a good save out of Dean yeah. yesterday. Um, so I thought that was going in. No, to be honest, maybe the curse is lifted. Um, maybe we sign him in the summer and he never scores again because you know <laughs> he'll, he'll get Jason Yule syndrome. But um, <laughs> yeah, just I, I'd have been more annoyed if we'd have lost that yesterday. But I'm not. I'm not really annoyed anyway because I'm. I'm just kind of like. The, realistically, we weren't going to go anywhere. And I think, uh, you know, we've got eight games left in the season after the international break. Um, there was a quote from Carrick saying, we're going to have to like let loose a little bit. I'm, like, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he means by that. Hopefully <laughs> something can come of that. Uh, I really don't want to see us lose at home to Sheffield Wednesday, but I also don't want to see a game against Sheffield Wednesday like earlier in the season. Just kind of finish the season now let us get to the summer and 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 rebuild really I, I think as soon as our season's pretty much done that will be my interest in football done for the year on but watching the playoffs or a relegation battle anything to do with the cups or anything like that i'll just move on to watching other sports for the summer and you know see how borough develop over the summer and yeah hopefully come back better at, at next season not Tom completely checking out after Boris' season just dies. Um, it'd be interesting to know what the listeners think, though, about basically how they're feeling. So, yeah, drop a comment below or tweet us, message us on Facebook, all that lovely stuff. Um, I do want to briefly touch on the three games before Blackburn, though, which was Norwich, QPR and Birmingham, because, of course, Borough win when we don't podcast. I mean, why wouldn't they? Tom, what were your key takeouts from those games? Again, Norwich, <coughs> Well, I'll, I'll go um, in, in order of the games. Norwich, I thought we were quite fortunate. Um, that red, gar- uh, red card clearly changed the game. Um, I messaged a good friend of the podcast, Matty Zorkel, at, uh, at halftime, and I was like, I haven't seen a replay. That seemed like an incredibly harsh red card, and if you lose this now, you've got every right to feel aggrieved by that. Um and watching it back afterwards, I'd still stick by that because it like my my first instinct when that happened, that incident, was give them both a yellow card, tell them to be on the win, yeah. like and and pretty much stop it. Um that is what I think most refs would do. I really didn't see the need for a red card, and obviously with it being appeals, neither did the FA uh, or the AFL, whoever's desired in that. Um but we were very fortunate from that. But what I do think that game did was at least give us the confidence to take into the next game against QPR. QPR, I thought we did play quite well. Um, I think the the moment that stands out to me was Rav's tackle uh, towards the... uh, I was in the second half, wasn't it? I don't know if it was necessarily towards the end of the game. But we stood really strong defensively, um, and and that's something we've needed. Um... I would say for the majority of this season, really, we've conceded far too many, let's be realistic, shite goals against us. So mm-hmm. uh, we, we needed to, to be more solid, and, and we did that against QPR. And then Birmingham, I suppose my key takeout is how bad are Birmingham? <laughs> like, how did oh we not God, score I more? <laughs> <laughs> I know, jeez. Are they the worst team that we've we played this season, Tom, do you think? You know what? It, 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 it'd be... Easy for me to say that. However, we've only beaten them one nil on in each fixture. So yeah, fair. Like at least we've beaten them though. Yeah. I mean, I mean we didn't manage to beat Rotherham and they're rock bottom rooted to the we didn't root, manage to beat Rotherham, rooted but, to the bottom. But to me, Rotherham as a as a team to watch looked absolutely horrendous at the riverside and they still managed to come away from, with something. Birmingham looked horrendous and 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 we beat them, but you know, I, I would say Rotherham looked worse and yeah, it's Crazy league, I suppose. But um, mm. yeah, I suppose, I suppose that's my key takeaway from that one. I, I kind of expect us to get a, a few more goals. Um, it's probably because I bet on Latte laughing in that one to uh, <laughs> to score after we'd scored in the previous two. Just wasn't ever going to happen. But um, 
yeah, I, I suppose with with all three of those games, though, you could kind of see confidence building back up in some areas. I did say on the last podcast a couple of weeks ago, we were maybe overconfident in what we were doing uh, in terms of the one-touch passing and stuff, but it's it did seem to click for a few areas of the pitch. I'm not going to say all because there was uh, there, there were points in our system yesterday against Blackburn that I think haven't quite clicked, and it, it's just it's going to be interesting to see. Like I say, after the summer, once we've kind of re not rebuilt but added some more quality to the team, as uh, as Mado said on on Tuesday yesterday, what we're going to look like and how we're going to play. Matt, which of those three performances were you the most impressed by? I think I was most impressed by QPR away from home. <clears throat> I agree with Tom, and I echo what he says about Norwich. I think for the first half an hour, we were absolutely terrible, and it was a continuation of what we'd had previous. I was watching that game. I couldn't go to it, but I was watching it on the TV, and I was looking at it and thinking, this is just more of the same, especially at home. It looked like things weren't improving and at all and then the red card completely changes the game i like tom thought it was harsh if the shoe was on the other foot i would have been quite annoyed had a borough player been sent off for that i kind of get the argument that he's gave the referee a decision to make and if there is a black and white rule on what is i guess deemed uh, a kick out and what isn't then i guess the referee maybe his hands were tied with with the decision he had to make but it it changed the game and I will say with Norwich, we we did what we had to do. We took advantage of the advantage we had, which was obviously 11 v 10. But I was still yet to be convinced by Borough at home. And I thought Norwich were really bad after that as well. So the jury was still pretty much out for me after that. But I thought QPR was was much better. I sort of saw that as the template for how Borough maybe should approach away games. You know, I, I've seen us so often go away from home to various different teams in the league concede the first goal it's normally as Tom said an absolutely shy goal um, from absolutely nothing gifted to the opposition and then we've got ourselves a, a mountain to climb and I, I liked QPR and the fact that the first half wasn't the greatest but we stayed in the game and we looked relatively solid and I think once we'd stayed in the game and got to half time we went we went up through the gears in the second half and I thought we took our chances really really well and I, I looked at that and I thought this is definitely what we should do going forward um, away from home. And Birmingham wasn't too different. I don't think we were as good against Birmingham, um, but it was one of them games where you've just got to find a way to win because they were absolutely diabolical. And I really looked at Black, uh, Birmingham and I, I, I worried for them seeing how Birmingham played that night. They were they just had all the hallmarks of a side who just looked like they were heading one way and that's down. So it was just good to see us in that scenario get the three points because we've seen so many times Borough head into that kind of game and scenario and, and fluff the lines and it was a wonderful goal by McGree. So yeah, overall I think they've, they've all got positives within them. I think as I say, our home form is still where I'm yet to be convinced but the QPR game was definitely the one which I looked at and thought, yeah, this is what we should keep good, keep doing going forward. I thought it was um, good for Lath and Force both to get on the score sheet as well. Say Rav made that outstanding tackle as well. So yeah, that would be the one I would say was definitely the best of the bunch. Obviously, the one that I didn't see out of the three of those is the best. It's typical. Um, yeah. Tom Carrick, Carrick switched to a three at the back against Norwich, and that's what we've stuck with since. What have you made of that wing back system? Because he had to change it realistically, didn't he? Because the four two three one just wasn't working. I think so. Yeah, and just to kind of preface this question as a general kind of rule in, in football, I don't really like watching teams playing three at the back slash five at the back. I think it's quite negative uh, some of the time, and I'd rather we played a 4 2 three, one or something like that and had more attacking players on the team. However, what I will say kind of in favour of the, the system in the last few games was something we've spoken about on the podcast for a lot of this season, Carrick came in last season. We did that 4 2 3 1, and the way it was set up because it benefited the players that we had. It really played to their strengths and kind of didn't, ex uh, I said, didn't expose the weaknesses or hit the weaknesses, whichever way you want to look at that. It I, I'd probably say played to our strengths more than hit weaknesses because our, our whole thing last year was, was attack and you're knowing we can outscore teams. Um, this season, it hasn't necessarily worked out that way. 
I would love it if next season, if we continue to recruit for the four two three one, and we can actually get that working again, because the football from last season has undoubtedly been so much better than any football this season, regardless of system. The change to free at the back recently, however, I do think it plays to the player's strengths. We've covered ourselves in defence. It allows Engel to get forwards, which we've been screaming about for, for ages on here. Just mm-hmm. let him get over the halfway line. It's allowed that. It's allowed Ayrland to do it as well, which I wasn't expecting that to be that much of a positive. But he did get, what was it, one or two assists from playing in that position. So, you know, fair play. He's done well there. House and O'Brien in the middle. I think that needed doing anyway, um, just to kind of take Barlas maybe out of the firing line in terms of, in terms of the fan reaction to him. And, um, you know, when, whenever he was on the ball, there was always a bit of nervousness because, as we've said many times, he just kind of wants too much time on the ball. Howison and O'Brien have a, a similar profile in terms of ball carrying, I think. So having them either side, and especially with O'Brien being left-footed, I feel like that kind of works. And then McGree... Playing behind like they laugh and force, I, f- I think that's worked quite well. Um, there was a long discussion about this on Tees yesterday, so I don't want to kind of take credit for that. But with force making the the runs up front, it's allowed like they laugh to to make his own kind of space and and, and getting behind, and that's really worked. So, in regards to the system, al- although like I say, I'd, I'd rather see us play the the system we were playing last year and play that well. I think this is the best choice for the for the moment, and it's going. It, it seems to be getting the best out of the players that we've got. So I really hope that after the international break, Van den Berg's back, and hopefully Forster's injury isn't too serious. I know what hamstring injuries can be like, but hopefully that can just be like a, I don't know, overly tight hamstring or something, and then he manages to get back fairly quickly after the international break. I do quite like the three at the back. I mean, I placed emphasis a few podcasts ago more on style than on system because I think Borough could probably be be more successful in counter-attacking situations and enabling those quick transitions. But with the 3-4-1-2, as you said there, Tom, I think it complements the two strikers up front because one can drop deep and create space in front. The other can, you know, maybe glide to the side a little bit like we saw yesterday and and shift out to the wide areas and then create that space centrally. So I think in terms of Marcus Force and Latte Lath, I think it complements both of them. I think they work better in a two than than in a, like Latte Lath playing in a one. But also, as you said, we have that width and you've got two players there in Isaiah Jones and Lucas Engel that are consistently holding that width to enable that distribution from the centre-backs to play that long diagonal over to the left or right flank. And I think what we saw yesterday and what we've seen in the past three games, obviously excluding QPR because I didn't see it, but I think we've we've started to see Borough try to play that ball more. Now, I do think at times it needs to be quicker because in the first half against Blackburn yesterday, I think Engel was in space and he just... The the ball that ball was too slow to come to him. But then also, I think our biggest problem in the second half was the actual execution of those balls. We were trying it; they just were wayward, and we did get sloppy in the second half. We will obviously go on to the Blackburn game. What irks me though about it is in regards to the width. We could have had that width in a four two three one because it's on instruction. Engel wasn't getting past the halfway line because obviously he was told not to. We saw last season, and I know people don't like us talk about last season, but again, I, I have to say it to fit this this conversation. Giles got really high up that pitch. You know, he was playing as a left winger. There's absolutely nothing that's been stopping Engel from doing that other than up on instruction. So that's what's irked me. It's that we didn't need to change two or three at the back to enable that. Yeah, I'd completely agree with that. I, I feel like it's, it's something... That got flagged a couple of couple of seasons ago as well. Do you remember um, in like late on in the the first Wilder season where Lumley was kind of coming out and playing sweeper keeper quite a lot, mm. and everyone was like, "Why is he coming off his line?" Like, yeah. like he's clearly been told to do that. Otherwise, he wouldn't be playing. Like, and yeah. and this is this is the kind of the same thing. Like the difference between Giles and Engel, it wasn't just like, "Oh, Giles has made up his mind to go forward all these times." That system was specifically set up to enable Giles to go forward and use his delivery to get balls into the box. 
we could have done the same with Engel, but for some reason mm-hmm. Engel was either not allowed to to go over the halfway line or got a nosebleed when he did. So, <laughs> like, it, it's definitely on instruction. I, I, I don't see any, any other kind of way of, of looking at that. Yeah, I think as well defensively, it, it has made Burr a little bit more solid. And I think, as you kind of mentioned, Tom, it suits the players that we have because I think Paddy McNair definitely suits three centre-backs or playing in a three centre-back defence rather than in a two because Paddy McNair is sometimes a little bit rash. Like he steps out aggressively and he loses the duel and suddenly we get caught in behind. We've seen that quite frequently with him. He bites a lot and I think he's less measured. So having that cover with that central centre-back gives him that safety net essentially so that when he does come out and when he does bite and try to win that tackle and if he loses it we've got that that player there as that safety net and then with Clark as well I like Clark I think he's a measured defender he's not the quickest and by god he turns like an Ariva but with that you've got that cover as well with that that central centre back so if he does get spun if there is a, a quick paced centre forward or winger that that maybe comes inside gets on him and turns him, at least you've got a Rav or, you know, whoever it is, obviously yesterday it wasn't because he was he was injured. You've got that cover there. So I think in terms of personnel, it suits us and it suits one player in particular, and that's Isaiah Jones. And we'll we'll get on to him later. But I think Isaiah Jones really does perform well uh, as a wing back. But Matt, I want to focus on Emmanuel Latte Lath for a second because he scored against Norwich and QPR, which means he's on seven goals for the season now in the league. He's averaging a goal every two games pretty much. What have you made of what you've seen of him this season? Because obviously he's been injured and he, you know, he's had a difficult season with that. But from what you've seen, what have you made of him? I th- I enjoy watching him firstly. I think he's absolute chaos on the football pitch. <laughs> there yeah. was a moment yesterday against Blackburn where I think he was coming off the left and he, he beat a man and then he just barged him over as he was like trying to retrieve the ball <laughs> he absolutely floored the centre back in the in the process and I, I love watching him because he, he is just so unpredictable and it's just absolute carnage when he's on the pitch and I, I do think there is some potential in like a lot I think there's a couple of players in the side who we've signed this season who I don't think there's a place in Borough's best team for them. I think Greenwood, I think Solvera, among a few, who I just don't think are good enough to be in Borough's best team. Whereas Lath, I actually can see him. I can see a place for him in Borough's best 11. Now, I do think that is alongside Marcus Force. I do feel like he, as you say, is not the best lone striker. I think he needs someone to play off of. I think earlier in the season, there was a couple of conversations around him maybe playing off of Josh Coburn for a period, seeing how that dynamic would work. Obviously, we didn't really get to see much of that. So I do think there's certain, maybe there's a certain system or a certain way of playing that that, that we'd have to utilise to play it with strengths to get the best out of him. But I think there is potential there. And, you know, if he was this refined centre forward who had brilliant decision-making skills and was absolutely clinical in front of goal, like a Cameron Archer or whatever, he wouldn't be playing for for Middlesbrough Football Club in the middle of the championship. So (laughs) he has flaws and I think we have to accept that he has them flaws and we're going to have to work to refine them. But I do think in time we we could do that and I think we might see him become a more clinical finisher. We might see his decision-making improve and if he has played alongside a partner up front, as we've seen with with recent games with Force, he he can bag some important goals. And you mentioned the injury as well. There is a, a part of me that's very intrigued to see what, what he would do maybe in the right system across a full season um, mm. because one goal in two games isn't a bad return. I mean, let's be fair. We've had, we've had strikers that have been a hell of a lot worse yeah. um, than, than the numbers like a last returning. I know obviously we were spoiled last season with, with Tuba and Archer and maybe our perception might be skewed a little bit and it might make Lath not look as good because he's followed up such an amazing double act last season and re- obviously replacing them and, and trying to replicate what they did was was impossible, really. So I think for what he's done, the money we, we, we bought him for coming into a new league, yeah, I don't know if I want to say he's underappreciated, but I, I see potential in Lath and I, I'd be intrigued to give him a chance and see see what he does in his borough side because I think if we play him in the right place in the right way, he could get us enough goals. Can I hang my hat on him as our as the striker who would get us the 20, 30 goals? Maybe not quite, but I think he can certainly contribute a lot in the future. 
I've really warmed to him, to be fair. I think at the beginning of the season, I just thought he was very erratic. And to be honest, because his season's been so broken up due to the injury, I think maybe he's not given the credit that I think he probably does deserve, you know, coming into a league that he's, you know, he's never played in England before. He doesn't speak English, but I think he's starting to see, or at least I'm starting to see that he's really wrapping his head around the game, the physicality, what's needed. You know, his movement's always been really good. Yes, his finishing can be erratic, but to have seven goals this season, despite his injuries, I think he's really, really good. And yeah, he is, he is chaotic. I did like the moment, yesterday where I just looked at him after the referee blew for half time and he's got his shirt off for some reason like I don't know why he had his shirt off but he did and I quite like him I think he's a good option to have and when I've spoken on the podcast before about Borough needing a striker that's just got a little bit of everything I think Latte Lath actually is that because he can drop deep he can stretch the play in behind he's physical like he can out muscle the centre half yeah centre half and also he's got a big spring on him to be fair considering that he's quite small for a center forward he can't half jump so and I think he did play out wide I don't know whether it's for St Gallen or for it might have been for Atlanta but he has played out wide as well so I think there's a there's a lot of versatility in what he can offer Borough not in positioning necessarily but just in attributes so I'm quite happy with Latte Laugh, to be fair. And I'm like you, I would like to see how he performs with a full season under his belt, uninterrupted. But let's talk about Blackburn then in full. And we'll break the game down in three parts. Before Force's injury, after Force's injury and the second half. So Matt, how would you assess Borough's actual start to the game yesterday? I thought we started really well. I really did. Um, I think in comparison to previous home games of late, I think you could really see the confidence running through the players. I think you could you could see recent results had just transformed the players' confidence compared to to prior to them away results. And I guess prior to the to the Norwich win or the, se- the second half of the Norwich game, they looked like a side transformed. The movement was really good off the ball. I thought Blackburn were struggling to handle us. I thought Isaiah Jones really. He was really effective on the right-hand side, offered us so much with. I think the combinations between him and McGree were really good. We were getting down the sides really well. And for me, I thought we looked like the only side who was going to score. I thought it was a matter of time before Borough got that opening goal. Um, So it was probably one of the best prolonged spells of of football I've seen at the Riverside for a long time. As I say, I wasn't at the Norwich game. So, yeah, I thought we started really, really well and it would be a matter of time before we scored. The combinations were really good. We just looked a little bit more incisive, a little bit quicker on the ball. And yeah, I thought we were going to be on for a, a good result and maybe bag a few goals. And then, um, yeah, sadly, the same old usual misfortune struck Borough with with the injury to Max Force and change of shape, change of personnel. We just weren't the same after that. So it was a real shame because I feel like the, the start of the game showed really good potential to what I think would have been a, a positive result for us. But as is the way with Borough this season, things just, just when you think they're going our way, something just pulls the rug from underneath us and that happened again. Yeah, I thought it was a really good start. I said to my dad within eight minutes, you know, we look really good here. And I even said that we're on the scent of something. We built up a... a a succession of corners we looked threatening they did not look like they knew how to deal with us they looked rattled Blackburn and it felt like we were soon going to put ourselves in a position to be leading that game and ultimately that never happened and I think a big factor that influenced the performance was Marcus Force's injury he went down and then he went off injured and when I saw that he was getting treated I saw the the two players that were warming up were Sam Greenwood and Finazaz. And I actually thought, get Sam Greenwood on because I don't particularly rate him, I'm not going to lie, but at least we've seen that he he can attempt to stretch the defence. Whereas with Finazaz, I don't expect that from him. What I expect from Finazaz is to drop deep. He'll want the ball in that midfield area rather than try to get in behind. And Borough, their fruitful avenue yesterday was getting in behind and stretching Blackburn's defence and running those channels. So when Finazaz came on, I think Borough dropped a little bit deeper between Latte Lath and uh, the midfield line where McGree and Azaz were. And everything was to feet instead of really trying to penetrate them with those balls 
behind the defence. Everything was in front of them instead. And I think it slowed our game down as well. When Azaz came on, it took him quite a while to get into the game and it took Borough quite a while to actually adjust to that change. So I think that that really did negatively impact our performance. And as well, I think it negatively impacted Latte Lath because he was isolated after that. And you could tell he was getting frustrated because he, he's really worked well recently alongside Marcus Force. So that changed absolutely. I don't want to say it killed us because I think that's too dramatic, but it definitely negatively impacted our performance. And Borough just never really seems to pick up from there. Our, our performance kind of was going upwards. You know, we started really well and then we kind of just stagnated and then plateaued a little bit. And I think that that change, that enforced change was really unfortunate but I actually do I actually do think that Carrick got that switch wrong because I, I would have preferred Greenwood on instead of Zaz just to keep that similar dynamic going I know that Greenwood does have the tendency to drop deep but I think out of him and Azaz he Greenwood probably would have been the one getting in behind but that was yeah it was really frustrating it still doesn't really account for Borough's second half performance Tom what did you make of that second half display? Not going to lie, I think I might have forced most of that second half display out of my memory from the Guinness that I was drinking last night. Because um, <laughs> it's patchy, but I, I, feel, I do feel like Blackburn not so much grew into the game, but maybe grew in belief that they could get something. I do remember, obviously, that, that Sam Gallagher chance that, that tested Dieng. Um a couple of corners down that end. Uh, and the Blackburn fans especially were, were kind of growing in, in noise and, and encouragement for the players. So I was like, it's just going to be typical that they're going to snatch one ear and and hang on to it. But um, no, I think it was very much, as as you just said, with um, with the force injury, I, I do think that really affected the, really affected Borough's game plan. Um, Azaz and McGree working behind Blackdale Laugh just didn't particularly work for for me in, in terms of um, chance creation. Uh, we, we did seem to be going down the wings a lot, but then when, you know, Aylin, Jones, Engel, etc. were looking up, there was no one in the box. And as much as Blackdale Laugh's got a good jump on him, he was pretty surrounded. So I'd have been more surprised if he had managed to, to get his head on something. But it was, um, yeah, I, I just felt creatively a lot of people were kind of stepping on each other's toes in terms of where they were. Um, and, and I also agree that Greenwood would have been the, the better change to make and and hopefully, you know, could have affected the se- second half in a better way than Azaz did because I think one thing I've noticed about Greenwood in the last few games since we've changed the system is when hit him and Silvera come on towards the end, it's generally, you know, around 70 minutes. Latte Laugh and Forsell have been doing a lot of running, a lot of closing down for that 70 minutes. So you just need 20 minutes of, of kind of energy. And in in the striker positions, I think Greenwood presses well, cuts the passing lanes well, and he, we have seen it over times this season. He is good at getting in behind. So I, for me, that would have been the change to make. And I think that could have led to a, a much better second half. But no, I think for me, it was it was a story we've seen a lot this season and that we'll have a lot of the ball. We'll be in the final third a lot, but offer nothing ultimately. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think it was just... it. It was mainly on that injury and the change of system yesterday, I would say. Mm, Yeah, I can't really escape it being boiled down to that injury. But I will say in the second half, Borough just got really sloppy. And actually, I think Blackburn threatened more. Like Looking at their XG in the first half, it was 0.16, which is just nothing. And then in the second half, it was 0.6, which is still... You know, it's better, but it's not massively like any, not a massive improvement. But I still thought that they threatened a little bit more, and and Bora just kind of fell off a little bit in the second half because I think our passing was incredibly poor. You know, the the way that we were struggling to really connect was uh, was really disappointing. But Matt, as I Jones came into the start eleven with Rav Vandenberg dropping out through injury, Ailing then switched to to right centre half. What did you make of Jones's performance? And I guess is his pos- best position right wing back yeah undoubtedly his best position uh, i like the 
I like the the three at the back system anyway because it gives the wing backs license to to get forward and that they've got the covering behind anyway. So unlike when we were playing a four at the back, it allows Engel to to get forward. He's got the cover of obviously Clark and, and same on the right hand side with Ailin dropping in. Um, but yeah, for me, I think Isaiah Jones is his best position is a right wing back. We saw that under Chris Wilder. Um, and I think just allowing him the license to to not only get forward, but literally sit on the the, the very, very edge of the pitch and just ensure that the, the defence is stretched as possible. I think it's massive for us because we have lacked width a lot in recent times. And I think that's been a huge reason as to why we've, especially at home, not been able to really break down teams or, or cause them any harm. So having Jones on the right-hand side, getting forward, having them combinations with what it was like McGree yesterday to start with, I thought was a real, real benefit for us. And I I noticed this in the time that that he was out with the team. And I think maybe, maybe, and I include myself in this, fans don't quite appreciate Jones as much until he's out of the side. But I think he was one of the players that we missed the most in that really barren spell of form that we've had since the turn of the year. So, yeah, I love him in this wing back position. And I know Tom alluded to it earlier about us going back to a phone. I kind of agree with that because I also want to see us playing the type of football we saw last season. I want to see us get back to just scoring goals and outscoring sides. But at the same time, I look at players like Isaiah Jones and I just feel like he is better in this system. So it plays to some players' strengths. As you say, Paddy McNair's another one. So, yeah, I love seeing him in this position, but I do wonder whether it's just a needs must right now. Obviously, if Rav Vandenberg comes back in, does Ailing then go back out? What happens to Isaiah Jones then? So I'm all for it, but I don't know if it's a temporary thing and, and if we'll stick to it and maybe we go back to a, a phone and, and Jones is, is back as just a right winger. I don't know. But for the time being, I'm happy as then. I, I do think it's his best position. Agreed. Tom, Norwich won, which means Bora are now seven points off sixth place. Do you think that's it now for Bora and, and the playoffs? Done? You know, I'd love to reply to this with one of me kind of like standard one word answers and just say yes, but knowing <laughs> how crazy this league is, mm. you know, we might come back after the international break and like win three and end up like in, in the playoff places. So I think it's it would be daft to kind of rule it out as like definitively as an answer there, but also I don't think we'll do it. Um, when I was talking about teams that have just done better than us this season. You've got the likes of Nor uh, Norwich, you've got the likes of Hull. I think Coventry might be up there. To be honest, I've stopped looking at the table other than where we are. <laughs> just just to make sure anyway. kind of we're, we're safe. But yeah, um, I think there's there's too many teams fighting for that sixth place for, for us to get in there. But there is always in most seasons that team that just kind of comes out of nowhere and picks up form at the right time and um and, and gets into sixth and ruins everyone's bets like I'm sure happened on Cheltenham every day last week. <laughs> well our next few games after the international break, we've got Southampton at St Mary's, then Sheffield Wednesday and Swansea at home, Hull away, Ipswich away, Leeds at home and Cardiff away. So there's some really tough fixtures, which is why I think yesterday's game was probably even more of an opportunity missed to be honest but Matt what what do you think do you think that's it for Borough's playoff hopes it's over yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna be brutally honest I, I I think it's it's done I get Tom's point completely um because we were saying this after the Stoke defeat uh last time and we would never I don't think have foreseen Borough winning the next three, we were we were looking at it as in, oh my god, if Borough lose to QPR and Norwich, we might be three points above the drop. And then you know, and it, you know, let's not underestimate the championship and how quickly things can change. But I think being a realist, looking at Norwich, Hull, Coventry, I, I think maybe with a good run we could over, overthrow one of them teams. But to overthrow all three and and get into the playoffs, I just can't see it. You'd need all three of them to drop off significantly. And I think we've just seen throughout the course of the season, they've all got enough quality and consistency amongst them, I think, for one of them to get sit quite comfortably. I think we, we could break into eighth, maybe seventh. It would be typical of Borough to get seventh and miss out by a point or something like that. Um, 
but yeah, I, I've looked at us for a long time and I've tried to I've tried to adopt the Michael Carrick approach of never get too high, never get too low. And I think we've just looked like the most eighth to tenth place team for a long time now. And I think that's mm. over a course of a season. You can judge us off of three games and say, yep, we look amazing. And then you can judge us over the, the, the games prior to that. And we looked absolutely shocking. But for me, it's it's our home form. You know, I think away from home, we're sixth in the championship. I think away from home, yeah, we're a playoff side. We've done really well. Went to a lot of difficult grounds and got some really good victories and, and good points. But at home, we just haven't got it. You know, I, I actually I actually look at the upcoming fixtures and, and think it's more likely we, we go and beat Southampton at St. Mary's than we do Sheffield Wednesday at home. I generally believe yeah. that with, with how Borough mm -hmm. play and, and how we are at the moment. So, yeah, we haven't quite got enough. And I think we are going to finish in that eighth to tenth position, which is where I think we've, you know, we've looked like we're going to finish all season. So I'm sorry to be the party pooper, but I think we've just given ourselves too much to do. Right, let's move on now and let's go to the prison place. The prison place is here and I'm certainly not going to put the people that are drilling two doors down in it, but Tom and Matt, I'll be interested to hear who uh, is going in your prison place from the past week. So Tom, do you want to kick us off? Who's going in your prison place this week? Yeah, I suppose we're catching up on four games, so I'll do four picks. Um, for yesterday's game, Matt Clark thought he was absolutely imperious at the back. Uh, for the QPR game, I'm going to go with Rav Van Denberg just for that um, that you know pretty much goal saving tackle. Um, and then the other two, I'm not I'm not going to go for a specific games for these, but uh, Force and Latte Laugh. I thought for for them to get goals in both the Norwich and QPR games seemed to be a good start of a good partnership. But you know this is why Borough fans can't have anything nice because. Some, one of them's going to get injured in, in a few games anyway. But, yeah, they're my four. Matt, what about you? I'm going to approach it slightly differently. I'm going to look at the players who I think have collectively improved Borough as a whole over the last few games. I think at the back, I think Clark's been a man mountain. I saw a stat, the number of clearances that he made, I think, in the Birmingham game it might have been. Uh, he's been a rock at the back. I think you could also say the same for Rav. He was outstanding before his fortunate injury because of course he's injured um, and McNair as well you could even throw him in there and I agree with Tom regarding the two centre forwards they could probably go in there as well but I think Johnny Housen I just I just every time you think Johnny Housen is dropping off and the time has come and it's time to put the old dog down <laughs> as horrible as that sounds he then just like reincarnates and just regenerates into a new version of Johnny Housen who just looks head and shoulders above anyone else we've got in the midfield and we just look so much better so much the balance is so much better we look so more reassured in midfield with him in there um, I still know he still has the odd mistake in him here and there giving the ball away and stuff but I think what we just look so much better with Johnny Housen in the midfield so I think him and the other players I've listed have, have been a big part in or his recent upturn in form. So I think there's quite a few you could choose from, but they're the, the collective group I'd go for. Well, I'm going to put Tom's dad in the prison place because I have to. He fixed my laptop after all. So shout out to Jason Repairwise. If anyone has any electronics that are broken, take them to Jace. Get in touch with Tom and he'll put you in touch with the Jace. So I massively appreciate him sorting me out there. I also want to mention Johnny Housen because I think he makes such a big difference. And obviously I have to because of his shithousery and getting uh, Borja signs sent off uh, midweek so I have to put him in there but I think he does make such a, a difference and I absolutely love when he just wallops into somebody and he just two, not two foots them but he really hard proper old school tackle it's it's just so Johnny House and so I have to put him in there and I think we really need to mention that Ralph Vandenberg challenge again because obviously I wasn't watching that QPR game so when I saw it come through on our telegram chat that he'd made a, a really crucial tackle, basically a goal saving tackle, I was really interested to see how that would look. And then when I when I watched the highlights back, if you if you look at the QPR fans, they're anticipating a goal, they're ready to celebrate it. And I think that's as good as a goal line clearance for me. And, and it very much epitomises Rob Vandenberg. He's very collected, he's very calm, he's very measured, and he plays very maturely and like he's he's kind of unflappable in those situations where he is the, you know the last line of defense 
before Senny Dieng, but obviously in this case, he kind of was the last line of defence. He just never panics. Uh, and he's, yeah, he's a very mature defender and he's having a, a really good season. I'm so sad that obviously he couldn't play yesterday because I think we were talking about this, funnily enough, with Matt Crooks. And I'm pretty sure Ralph Vandenberg was one of just a few players that have not been injured this season. I, I know he had that hand injury, but I don't think it sidelined him, did it? I, someone might correct me with that. Tom, you're on mute. Maybe for a game, <laughs> yeah. Once again, yeah, I, I think it was for one game and then he came back after that, but he, he had the from bandaged up. Mm. It's a Rolls Royce. Well, Just drop my, yeah. my bag of cliches and, and chuck one in there. <laughs> I mean, it's usually me that, that says the cliche, so I'm glad that you've taken my title there, Matt. But yeah, I think, right. I, I guess what I said there is not true then, but he's one of those that is, for the most part anyway, been available and he's been really fantastic this season. So yeah, praise the place this week. Ralph Vandenberg's tackle, Johnny Housen in general, but specifically his shit shithouser against Norwich and then Jay Scree, Tom Stad. Uh, but we'll move on and we'll talk about podcast questions. Podcast questions is obviously where you send us whatever you want us to discuss this week. You know where to to find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram. We're everywhere, really. But we've got one question this week from Aiden on Facebook, and he says, "If you could pinch any player from any other team in the Championship on a free." Who would it be? Now, we had a discussion about this in our WhatsApp group chat last night. So, Matt, who would your pick be? I went with Jorginho Rutter from Leeds United. Um, picking a Leeds player was absolutely painful, um, but it had to be done, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but I just I, I look at his all-round contribution to Leeds as a side, and I think of Tuba and what he gave us last season I sort of approached it in the fact of what part of Borough's current side do I think we're missing the most and obviously you're always going to make the comparison and look back to last season and I think the player we miss the most for me is Tuba Akpom just because of how he affected Borough's entire system from midfield to attack and I just looked at Rutter and I, I saw sort of similar characteristics I, I nicked a tweet and I saw someone post this, and I've completely forgotten who it was, so I can't credit them. But um, he's created the most chances in open play in the Championship 2024. He's made the most successful take-ons, won the most duels, played the most through balls, won the most fouls, and his overall goals and assists as well. I think he's nearing double figures in goals. I think he's got 13 assists or something like that. So I think just as an all-round contributor to a side who offers... A little bit of everything, I would go with Jorginho Rutter, albeit I think he cost Leeds about 30 million. So getting him on a free would be something, wouldn't it? But in this hypothetical situation, that's who I would mm. go with. It's the glory of the question, Matt. Tom, it is the glory. <laughs> what about you? Yeah. Well, what about you? I'm, I'm a little bit gutted this uh, this question came a year later because I could have said Victor, Victor Gokarez and we'd have picked up about 500 more viewers from the Coventry fans that spawn in whenever you say his name. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was a difficult one for, for me to decide on because there were quite a few players that I potentially think about. Um, Adam Armstrong being one of them. Um, I've thought about Ryan Giles, even though he's only on loan to Hull. But then I'm like, if we've got Ryan Giles, gets up the pitch, who is he even putting crosses into? And then... For me, it was it was then choosing either Harry Winks, Dewsbury Hall, or Joel Perot. Um, and I think out of those three, I'd go with Harry Winks, just because he, he shouldn't be playing in this league. Uh, to be fair, and I think as a as someone who would kind of fit into our system and uh, and and our formation play him alongside Hackney in, in centre midfield in this hypothetical scenario, which I know is absolutely never going to happen uh, un unless, you know, it happens at another team. Um, so, yeah, I I'd probably go with, uh, with Harry Winks. Well, I was looking at a striker because that's what Borough need at the end of the day. 
<clears throat> so I've went with Josh Sargent of Norwich. He's got 13 goals and 18 appearances this season. Now, if if I was to have said that answer about two years ago when he was in the Premier League, I probably would have laughed at myself because he was kind of he was one of those players that was laughed at, such as his lack of performance basically in the Premier League. He was kind of ridiculed as all well, that that shite American striker. But actually, in the Championship, he's really kind of found his his home and his place and he's performing really well this season. And I think he's one of those strikers that's just like, their all-round game is really good. And I think that's what Borough needs. So, yeah, again, in this hypothetical situation, I've gone for Josh Sargent. But before we go, guys, I think we need to end with a mention for Chris Mosley. Borough's physio since 2002. Yesterday was his 1,012th and final game for Borough before he heads to the States to join New York Red Bulls. Best of luck to Chris and a massive congratulations and well done for over two decades of service to Borough. I bet he's seen some absolute shite in that time. But anyway, that is it, guys. We now say goodbye to Borough and hello to the March International break. Take care, keep your laptops working and up the Borough breakdown.